Good morning. Good afternoon. Church here just keeps going on and on and on and on. What a wonderful uh, honor it is to be here in uh, your beautiful city, Coeur d'Alene. All the beautiful weather you're having. <laughs> Last time I was here, it was so sunny, so beautiful, and so... And it still is, flying in. It's just one of the most beautiful cities in all of Idaho. Maybe the Northwest. That's why so many Californians are loving this. <laughs> we have a word for them, too. I'll let you think of that word. <laughs> it's a beautiful place to raise your family and a beautiful place to find a church like this. You're honored and privileged to have uh, a wonderful church, beautiful city, amazing friends, all that you have wrapped up in your life right now, do not take for granted. Amen. Do not, because it's a blessed thing that you can find a well like this in Coeur d'Alene. This church, this place, it's a special place. I want to honor Pastor J.O. and Ray Dean. And I want to say that I think they're just two of the best pastors in the whole world. And that they have built a... Come on. What a full meal deal. J.O. and Ray Dean together, it's dynamite. Yeah. Uh, we've walked together for many years uh, with our ministries from the time that they started until now. And with MFI, the group that I work with, uh, J.O. and Ray Dean both are very highly respected in our group. They always have a word at the conference. I always have them involved at our annual conference. We do the regional here tomorrow. Uh, a couple hundred leaders from this region will come together and we'll sit with the teaching with myself and Bob and J.O. and others. And uh, just in part, and it's a wonderful thing that this church has so much hospitality. Uh, you folks uh, just really know how to do it. And I thank you for allowing MFI to be in this region, to be at this church. It's a lot of work, and it's hopefully not an interruption to you. It's something that you impart to these pastors and leaders, and it will be a wonderful thing. So the church that has this specific specialness to it does not happen accidentally. Understood, yeah. nothing accidental about building a church like this. And there's nothing really mysterious or secret either. If you follow the model, follow the pattern, follow the scriptures, you do what the Lord says and you build a good foundation. And you work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. <laughs> then you stretch yourself into the vision and you buy buildings and raise money and plant churches and send missionaries and hire the right staff and make sure every Sunday there's food on the table and presents in the house. It takes work to build the house of God. It doesn't just show up on Sunday and somebody put it together. I want to thank Seth and his team. I really love Seth. Uh, I've known Seth his whole life. And Seth, he sent me a... a well, actually, J.O. sent me the advertisement for me speaking that Seth put together. <laughs> Did you guys see that advertisement? That he likened me to, you know, Gandalf. That's right. <laughs> and Yoda. All, all, all the biblical characters we know. You know, Gandalf and Yoda and Tom Landry and Landry. And, you know, he's, it was... It was the most unique introduction <laughs> I've ever had at any church. And uh, the way he did it. But I noticed something. I noticed something. 
that he trimmed his beard before I got here. <laughs> I did notice it's just a little shorter. And I think he did it because Papa Frank was coming and he didn't want to make me look so bad with my short, short beard. I thought I had a good beard going until Don picked me up. <laughs> then I thought, Idaho. <laughs> Probably packing a gun under the seat. <laughs> Bob Johnson is here from Montana. So Bob pulls up a picture for me. He says, uh, you want to know what Montana's all about, Frank? I said, sure, Bob. He pulls up a picture. First, he can't find it because he's old and doesn't know technology. <laughs> so, and I'm old and don't know technology. And so he's screening and trying to, he says, it's in here somewhere. And I said, yes, it, I believe you, Bob. <laughs> and he finally pulls up this picture and it's a, it's a soccer game in Montana, kids playing. I said, oh, well, that's great. You have, you have soccer in Montana. Uh, no, he says, no, see her in, look at the ref. Oh, the ref has a huge pistol on his side. <laughs> the ref, the ref has a huge pistol refing these young kids and he is simply saying, ain't nothing gonna happen here. <laughs> ain't, ain't nothing gonna happen here. Now, if that was in California, they'd be, you know, trying to lock him up. Oregon, I don't know what they would do in Oregon. But Montana, he's repping with a gun on his hip. Oh, God, make the whole world like Montana. <laughs> Idaho. Last time I was here, which was years back, I, I made the mistake of asking because I'm, I'm just not thinking there's going to be much about this. But I said, you know, people been in churches where now security guards have real guns and even some people in the church have a gun and they bring it. But how many people at heart of the city have a gun and they're packing a gun? Would you lift your hand? Oh, my God. And that's what happened last time. I just went... I'm in the safest place in the United States of America. And make sure you take them out before they fire. I've never seen so many people pack a gun in church. I don't know what Gandalf would think about it. But I feel safe. I'm honored to be here. You're, you're a unique, wonderful, responsive people. Fun to preach to, fun to be with. And I want to not meander too much because this is the third piece of a message that was supposed to be one message. And so now I'm on part three of the one message. And my wife simply says to me when I finish this morning, you didn't get very far. I said, it depends on how you look at it. <laughs> I've been known. All right. We're talking about a specific subject that will apply to everybody sitting in this room and everybody listening somehow through the media, whatever. I'm talking about the church today. I'm going to talk about the church, but I'm going to talk about the church in a very specific way. The name of the message is the making of a church mantle, the making of a church mantle, the making of a church, everyone say, mantle. one more time. Mantle. Now, normally, most people who have attended church, been around the Bible, they would recognize the word mantle as being, I think I've heard that word somewhere, and I think it was in the Old Testament with the prophet Elijah, who had the young man Elisha who he threw his mantle upon, and when he put his mantle upon that young man, and then after years of serving, he got the full use of the mantle. And so the mantle throughout the Old Testament represented something more than a garment. It represented what the person was. It represented the gifting. It represented the supernatural. It represented the anointing. It represented so many pieces of Elijah. 
And so when he threw that on the young man, there was something symbolic being done because the mantle was being received. And as you go through the Old Testament, the mantle is something that can be studied. It's something that can be uh, acknowledged and assimilated into your understanding that God has a mantle for people. Now, we understand that mantle falls upon leaders. There's, there's no doubt about it. Most leaders would understand. And we would even use the terminology. There's a real mantle on that man. Or, uh, you know, that young guy really has a, a mantle for prayer, a mantle for worship. Or I heard him speak. He really has a mantle of the word of the Lord on him. So we use the word. And we use it, I think, uh, in, a, in a correct way because we're simply saying there's something on that person. There's something on that person. Now, every one of you, which I'm not speaking on the individual anointing and mantle, et cetera, that you have, I'm going to talk about the corporate body of Christ, the church, and specifically heart of the city church. But every person sitting here, you've been clothed with the mantle of the Holy Spirit around your life. You have a mantle. And that mantle has within it the gifts, the powers, and the future that you're going to live. That mantle is something that is given to you by the Lord Jesus, and it rests upon you. We're talking about the mantle as resting upon the congregation as a community, the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones, that congregation. In the New Testament, we understand the congregation to be defined very easily. Old Testament, it was Israel, and the congregation was defined. But not everyone who was in Israel as a Jew was actually part of the God congregation. And that's what it says in Romans. And so there were people that were born into Israel, but they weren't born into the covenant that was put on the congregation. They were still people that were away from the Lord or would not serve the Lord or actually resisted the Lord on many occasions. So it is in the New Testament, those are of the ecclesia, those are people who have bought into Christ, been born again, and they're added. Everyone say added. added. They're added to the church. All right, the word mantle, how I will define it. A mantle is a powerful anointing. A powerful anointing and call that rests upon a church to demonstrate God's majestic, superior, and magnificent glory and grace. We're talking about a local church mantle. We're talking about these words from the Hebrew to the Greek. The Hebrew translates several Hebrew words and root words to come up with this word mantle. The New Testament translates several words to come up with the equivalent of mantle, which I'll give you. So the mantle has been translated glory and splendor and mighty and, and, and roomy. And uh, roomy is a great translation for that Hebrew word because the roomy garment that God puts on us is something we grow into. So it's the mantle God puts on us, but it's not an Italian suit fit. It's a roomy fit. It, it has room for you to grow. And so it is with the church. And so when we come to the New Testament, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel. And we have the gospel preached by Jesus. And then we have the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Then we have the 40 days of the kingdom seminar that Jesus does. It's referred to in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, that when Jesus ascended up on high, he also went down, took the keys from the gate to hell. And then it says he appeared as a risen Christ for 40 days, for 40 days, for 40 days. You would listen very intently to a teacher who has risen from the dead. If you were in a room for 40 days with someone who died, and you knew him, and you buried him, and you were at the tomb when he came out, and he appeared to the 12, the 70, the 500, and then he picks 120, and he says, I'm going to teach you about the kingdom of God. I would love to see the videos on that seminar. <laughs> would you not want to hear if Jesus just would have been born today, it would have been all over social media. Resurrected teacher, teaching a seminar for 40 days. 
on sale on eBay. That's what it would be. Jesus in front of them for 40 days teaching on the kingdom of God, teaching on what's going to happen. And finally, he ascends up on high. You do that one more time and you're out of here, buddy. Okay. <laughs> That's what Gandalf would do. <laughs> so Jesus brings them to the end of the teaching, and they have questions. Of course, their questions are about the end times. When is this going to happen? How is it going to happen? How do we know this? And Jesus simply says, no man knows this. Only the Father knows this. So don't worry about it. You're not concerned about the end. You're concerned about the beginning right now. Forget about the end. And so his words to them was, stay where you are. And there will be a visitation. My spirit will come upon you. So now, after the 40 days, they stay in the upper room for 10 more days. It's the 50th day which is Pentecost. So actually, in the physical calendar, the, the real calendar of the Jewish world, the feats of Israel with Passover and Pentecost and, and, and into the feast of harvest, Jesus is actually doing everything according to the feast. Even his resurrection is the feast of first, first fruits. And so now he comes to the 50th day. There's no accident that it only taught for 40. And then he said, wait for 10, because on that 50th day, there will be a Pentecost, and there will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that Pentecost will match what happened at Sinai, where there will be wind and fire and all that that happened to Moses. But now it's going to be something different. So there's a fulfillment going on in this little bit of teaching that Jesus is giving, actually a whole lot of teaching. And so on the 50th day, sure enough, says in Acts 2, 1, and suddenly, how suddenly is it that they've waited three and a half years, 40 days of teaching, and 10 days of prayer? It's not so sudden, really. But it happened suddenly how they did not know it was going to happen. They did not know what was coming. All they were told is wait. Everyone say wait. Hardest thing for all of us to do is to wait on the Lord, especially for those guys in that room and gals, 120, as they're waiting on the Lord. What are we waiting for? Well, we know Jesus said to pray and wait, and we would be clothed with power from on high. I'm not sure what that means, but sure enough, the Holy Spirit fell on that Pentecost day. Everyone shout Pentecost. Pentecost. And that's what we're celebrating today all over the U.S., we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday, and there's something about that. It's funny that even the, the people that are not tongue speakers or spirit filled are celebrating Pentecost Sunday. I, 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 it, it humors me. Uh, so on that day, it fell. What happened? Wind, fire, tongues sat on each one of them. And all the people in the courtyard heard their language yes. as these people that were speaking in tongues were preaching the gospel. This is in your Bible. And they heard, and then it lists all the nations, which is a great study to go through on what nations were there and what languages were represented in the nation and what they heard on the day of Pentecost. And so at that point, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and they received the fire and the wind and the tongues, the place was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. All the people, now there's thousands gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. There's no accident here. There's thousands in the outer court. They can't come into the inner court. They're outside. They're in the outer court. And so the apostles go to the people and the people are saying, what's going on? What's happening here? And that's where you get the first sermon from Peter, where Peter stands up and he says, listen, this is that. That was Joel 2, 28. Remember, they have no New Testament. They only have 
the Old Testament Bible. So Peter stands up and he said, this right here, this is what Joel talked about when he said, in the last days there will be a pouring out of the Spirit upon your sons and daughters, and there will be people that will receive the spiritual language and prophecy and signs and wonders. And he starts preaching. And Peter, on that sermon at that point, he had never preached under the unction of the anointing like he did on this one because they didn't have it until now. They were touched by Jesus. They were taught by Jesus. They were with Jesus. But now the Holy Spirit has clothed them, come upon them, is on them in the power. The, they were mantled with something that was unbelievable. And so when Peter preached, he preached with power and immediately... 3,000 people respond. What do you do with that altar call? <laughs> what do you do with the book of Acts? And it says they repented. Everyone say repented. Yes. Important word. Yes. They believed. believed. Come on, talk to me. And they were baptized. baptized. Not sprinkled. Not sprinkled. <laughs> Dunked. They were immersed. immersed. Okay, I'm preaching now. You can stop. <laughs> Where did they find the water? How many people did this? Was it just the 12 apostles? Did everybody baptize their friend? All these questions, but we do know this. At that point, the church was birthed. At the fullness of times, the church sprung up. What kind of a church? A praying church. A tongue-speaking church. I don't care what denomination you're from. It was a tongue-speaking church that changed the first world. They spoke in tongues. If you buy the shoes, the tongues come with it. When they bought into the message, they bought into the gospel... There was no theological debate. Right. Well, is this a glossolalia that's only for this temporary time period that the apostles, or is that which is perfect has come as the word of God and we don't need tongues? And are the gifts for now? Or later? There was no theological debate that we have now written books about. They just entered in and enjoyed it. Right. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter began to preach. He was mantled to preach. It says in Acts 4.33, Acts 4.33, and with great power, everyone say great power. great power. Now, we're talking about the mantle on the church. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace. Everyone say great grace. Great grace. Everyone say great power. Great power. Great grace was upon some of them. What, what was that? Oh, did I make a mistake there? And great grace was upon them all. Now this is the first church in the New Testament. This is the church that Jesus said, wait, tarry, and when the power comes, you'll know what to do and you will build my church. It's a fulfillment of Matthew 16, 18. And the whole Peter thing and Acts 2, who does it? Peter. Peter. It's a fulfillment of a promise. Historically, spiritually, dynamically, church is birth. What kind of a church? A spirit-filled church. What kind of a church? A praying church. A bold church that had great power and great grace upon them. What, what time is this service out, Bishop? 12.30? Okay, well, there are some people that wouldn't appreciate me just going as long as I... Okay. All right. Okay. I'm not trying to manipulate you to get more time, 
but I'm trying to manip manipulate someone to get more time. <laughs> Lest we have an installment message number four, which we don't have another service to do. Everyone say great power. Great power. Great grace. Great grace. Equals. Equals. Mantle. mantle. So when we talk New Testament mantle, we're talking great power, great grace, Holy Spirit activity, prophetic spirit upon them, the bold preaching, everything wrapped up now is going to be in this mantle. So now you follow the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, you have all the different cities that the Apostle Paul and team went to and Peter and team went to. You have the prophets and the teachers and all, all this begins to wrap into a picture. And so throughout the book of Acts, you have Jerusalem, the first church, first six chapters of Acts. And you see that Jerusalem is very pastoral. House to house, breaking of bread, prayers, meeting together, you know, healing, all the stuff that happened. They're also the first church that established giving with a bang. Why? Because you had a couple people that held some money back. And when they came in, the apostle said, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. You said you gave it all, but you kept back a piece. You know, you didn't have to give it all. You could have just said, I'm going to give a piece and not all. But now you've lied to the Holy Ghost because you told us it's all, but it's only a part. And so what are we going to do with you? In the New Testament, this is so different than today. We might say to them, well, we're very sorry you did that. But, uh, you know, you probably shouldn't say that. You, you maybe need to make up for this. But in this day, establishing the fear of the Lord, Peter just said to them, drop dead. And lo and behold, the husband fell over dead. I call that New Testament church. And then when the wife came in, she lied. He says, you're going to join your husband. She dropped dead. And when the word got out to the people, everyone was counting their pennies. I'm going to give 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Hit 10. Honey, is it 10? Hit 10. Don't you hold anything back. You're trying to buy some donkey shoes or something. You're not going to be able to do it. We got to give everything we said we're going to give. The fear of the Lord came upon them about giving because the church was being established. And it took the fear of the Lord to do that. Moving along, you have then the other cities that Paul visits and he establishes. We're looking at just one of them in Acts 11. Acts 11 is the city of Antioch. Don't get it mixed up when you read your Bible. There's two Antiochs in the book of Acts. The one I'm preaching about this morning is in Acts 11. And so the Antioch church was different because it started different. It didn't start with an apostle. It didn't start with a prophet. It didn't start with a full-time, five-fold ministry type person. It started with the lay people. It started with all the people who had experienced something through what happened in Jerusalem and that had trailed down to the nations. They went out preaching that gospel and preaching about the Holy Spirit and God came into Antioch and a great church was raised up. And so they sent for the apostles to come. Barnabas comes first and then Paul and they're trying to understand what's going on. And I'm picking up on Acts 11.23. And when he, Barnabas, came, Antioch, and notice now, and had seen the grace of God. What did he see? What did he see? As he, as he got with the Antioch congregation, he saw the invisible. Because you can't see the grace of God. You can't see the spirit of God. You, you can't see the kingdom things that are invisible. You only see the reflection or the result of. But this apostle is saying, I, I see something. I see 
grace on these people. Different levels of grace. You get saved by grace. That's a level. You grow by grace, Peter says. That's a level. You get gifts of the Spirit by grace. That's a level. So there's different scriptures that talks about different levels of the grace of God. And there's also this thing we're talking about that he saw, corporate grace. A grace that rests on a church. That invisible something that comes upon a congregation because of the Holy Spirit activity and other things happening, but the great, the mantle. I'm talking here, grace and mantle. The mantle that was on Antioch. And he encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord because he saw the mantle. Then he sent for Paul, and Paul came up, and Paul was taken back. What a group of people talking to a couple this morning that came over after the service and they were telling me how they got it here. They said, well, it might sound funny to you, but when we pulled into the parking lot, we felt something. <laughs> Not funny to me. And when we came into the service, we felt something. There was something on this church that was different. And the more we came, the more we felt, the more we saw, the more we wanted. Until we made it our home. Because there was something in that room that caused us to come back. Come back. I've heard people over and over and over again talk about what happens to them when they come in to our services. When we were pastoring in Eugene and then also in at Bible Temple for 25 years in Portland, there was something in the room. There was something in our worship. There was something happening that was invisible, but felt. And people would come to me all the time with tears rolling down their cheeks and saying, Pastor Frank, I don't know what it is, but there's something in, in this place. I said, yep, <laughs> there is. Do you know what it is? Yep. What? Presence. Presence of what? Spirit. What kind of spirit? Holy. <laughs> spirit. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, other things have to leave. When the Holy Spirit shows up, Demons leave. Bondages get broken. Lies on people's minds get broken off. Because the Holy Spirit falling upon the people of God. The Holy Spirit that comes just like in the book of Acts. It's the same with us right now today. It's available to every one of us. When that Holy Spirit falls upon a congregation, you don't have to worry about getting a, a special group of demon, demon caster out or people. <laughs> You're all demon casting out people. You don't have to have a special group just to pray for the sick. You all Pray for the sick. You all move in the gifts of the Spirit. You all believe for the supernatural. It's not a platform that's going forward here. It's a congregation. So the Holy Spirit falls. All right. Here's the mantle that was on the Antioch Church, and I believe it's on you. And I'm not limiting you to the points I'm giving just from Antioch. Because you might want to weave a mantle, and you normally do, of a Jerusalem, Antioch, some from Corinth. Just make sure you get the right part from Corinth. <laughs> There's some things about Corinth you don't want to sew under your garment. When you, when you look at Thessalonica, you look at all the different epistles written to these different churches in these different cities. All of them are different. Different. And you can weave those truths in your mantle. We're just looking at the Antioch one 
and I'm moving so, so slow. This is called the snail anointing. <laughs> Number one, the supernatural empowering mantle. This is all in Acts 11, Antioch Church, verse 21. The hand of the Lord is with them. Everyone say the hand of the Lord. So the hand of the Lord represents something more than just a physical hand. It's obviously uh, anthropomorphism. Everyone say that? It's a something that represents something else. It's a metaphor. It's a all the Bible is filled with this kind of language. And so the hand of the Lord sometimes says the arm of the Lord. Sometimes it says the eyes of the Lord. But there, there are no hands, eyes, or arms in heaven. Do you understand? God is spirit. Now Jesus is now the resurrected body in heaven. But God moves by his spirit. And this represents the hand of the Lord. Represents what? If you study the hand of the Lord throughout all of scripture, it represents provision. Protection, promotion, and prophetic assignment. Provision, protection, promotion, prophetic assignment. The mighty hand of God. All right, number two. The passion for the lost mantle. Acts eleven twenty one. a great number believed and turned. I did this in the last service so you can listen to that video or however they do it around here. Uh, but we talked about the prodigals. We talked about the Isaiah scripture calling forth from the northeast, west, south, calling in the unsaved, calling in the prodigals intentionally. Number three, there's a powerful grace mantle that rests on this Antioch church. They saw the grace of God, which is the evidence of the working of the grace of God, the evidence of the power of the grace of God. Grace, spirit, and atmosphere belongs in the local church and that grace, spirit, and atmosphere is a quality of graciousness. Graciousness. It's attractive to the unsaved when people are kind and grace-ish, gracious. If you're a mean Christian, you know, there's bumper stickers that talk about you. It says mean people What's the word? Stop. Gandalf would not say that out loud. <laughs> but that is exactly right. So you want a church that has a graciousness to it. It doesn't mean you comprehend everything going on in the person's life that you could reject. It, it doesn't mean you, you compromise. But you, there's, there's even a graciousness in confrontation. There's a graciousness in a church Helping you with difficult people. How many of you know some of you were difficult? <laughs> how many know that some of you might still be difficult? <laughs> and how many of you know you need a lot of grace on you and the people around you need even more grace? <laughs> I used to say to our church all the time, and it was kind of a joke, but I would say, you are a piece of work. <laughs> so I'd have them turn to each other and tell someone else. Go ahead and do it right now. Tell someone, you're a piece of work. You're just a... Now, you've been wanting to say that all day. You've been wanting to say that to somebody all morning. You're a piece of work. And there's different levels of saying, you're a piece of work. You're a piece of, you're a piece of work. There's different levels in how you interpret that. But you understand, we are all on a journey of becoming something that we should become, but we're not yet there. And so God needs to fix us with a fix that we can't unfix so that he can fix what's in us because we won't fix it ourselves. So he puts us in a place where we can't do it ourselves. And so even though you are under the hand of God, you're being shaped and God uses some things to shape you that you would never choose to shape yourself. Matter in fact, there's people sitting here right now that are ticked off, but you're in a place where God is doing something. And you're trying to wiggle out, and God says, no wiggling. I have you right where I want you. All right. Number four, the unified purpose mantle. That with purpose of heart, they continued on. Acts 11:23, 23, the purpose of heart. 
urging them to stay the, uh, the course, devote their hearts to it. For us, the purpose that we're talking about in Acts 11, the purpose they had discovered, is a thing called the eternal purpose. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. Think about this. Before there was sin, before there was earth, before there was Adam and Eve, before they fell into sin, before there was a Jew, before there was a Gentile, in the heart of God, it says in Ephesians 3.10, he already thought and had planned to make the church. So the church was in eternity past in the counsel of God. It's in your Bible. So God was not surprised. Oh, no, Adam blew it. Adam blew it. No, Eve blew it. Never mind. They both blew it. <laughs> what do we do now? You know, Michael's taking notes. Gabriel taking notes. I don't know. It messes up the whole chart we had. This is a terrible thing because <laughs> now they've messed up the garden. We spent so much time building for them. And so I don't know what we're going to do. There was no discussion in heaven like, oh, my goodness gracious. God just said, all in the plan. They fell because it was the plan of God that they fall. I could go off on that for an hour. And God says, my plan is before man, and my plan is the church. When people talk to me about Israel, and they want me to get really excited about what God's going to do in Israel, and I do. Israel is a special place, special people, and it has a place in the scriptures. But Israel itself does not replace the church. The church is the eternal purpose before there was a Jew. So God didn't change his plan just when the Jew came along. And then the Apostle Paul says in Romans 9, and I'm off again. All right, point number five. There you go. My, my students used to say when I taught in college, they would say to me, Pastor Frank, we love your teaching, but well, you, know, you know what we really love? Your tributaries. <laughs> I didn't find that to be complimentary. Number five, the faith leadership mantle. Acts eleven twenty four. 24, good leaders full of the Holy Spirit and faith, controlled by the Holy Spirit. They have faith. They're incredible. They see, they do. You have great leadership here with great faith, and you have to have that. If there's one thing I say to pastors all the time, the one thing you have to have to pioneer, to pastor, to work, to do anything, faith. You've got to have faith. Yes, you need wisdom, but you need more faith than wisdom. Yes, you've got to have a smart mind. You need more faith than smartness. Why? Faith is what makes things happen. And great faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. That's what great faith does. And it says in Luke 17, 5, the apostles said to the Lord, and this is us right here, increase our faith. Yeah. Everyone say out loud. Come on, how many could go for an upgrade of faith and say... Come on, let that be your life and your prayer. Number six, the apostolic equipping mantle. Acts eleven twenty six. 26, the apostle Paul taught the people, didasco is the word used here, which is a, a full realm of teaching and formation, a discipleship. It's more than just information download. And so the apostle equipping mantle is on this church to raise up leaders, to have intern programs, to have a Bible college, whatever you call, whatever you do to raise up leaders. You need to have leaders that are coming up that are centered in the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is the only thing that will stand the test as we build the church. And so the Word of God has to be central. Number seven, can I hear an amen? Amen. How many thank God for J.O. preaching the Word of God? And, and Ray Dean preaching the Word of God. Number seven, the prayer, worship, and counter mantle. You got this down. This is Acts 13, too. While they were ministering to the Lord, while they were worshiping, they were uh, ministering to the Lord, worshiping church. Acts 13, too, talks about what they did. And in their praise and their worship, there came a presence. And in that presence came a prophetic. And in that prophetic, they sent out people, laid hands on them, which is all in your Bible. There's nothing weird that we do with our kind of churches to lay hands on people and prophesy. It's absolutely normal for the New Testament. Number eight, they had a prophetic voice mantle. And the band can make their way to the platform slowly. 
Number eight, they had a prophetic voice mantle. Acts 13, 2, the Holy Spirit said. Okay, now, Amen. you're sitting there in Antioch. You're waiting on the Lord. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit says, okay. How did the Holy Spirit speak? Did the Holy Spirit speak audible? Some of you haven't read even Acts 13, I can tell. You're going, mm hmm. <laughs> no, there was no audible, there was no inward. Holy Spirit said was through the prophets. So God uses. Holy Spirit internal for sure, in your ear for sure, but also prophets. And, and could I say true prophets? Yes. Not weird prophets. Right. Not false prophets. Right. Not make-believe prophets. Right. Not people who would be a prophet because they laid hands on themselves in front of a mirror. That saith the Lord, I am a prophet. Oh. Not talking about that. I'm talking about prophets that are planted in the house of God, proven character. Thank you. You can keep it. It, it. This is your souvenir of me preaching. Come on, how many would vote with me? We need some good prophets. It still amazes me how people follow people on internet and social media, and some of these prophets are so out to lunch. They say whatever comes into their mind. They predict things, whatever comes into their mind. And nobody ever calls them forth to say it didn't happen. What you prophesied never happened. Why don't you use the same social media to say you missed it? Don't follow flaky prophets. Be careful of social media. Be in a local church that brings in good prophets. People that are trustworthy with character. The Holy Spirit said, and Frank said. <laughs> what do you think, Seth? Okay. I'm ending right here. Number nine, the God-sized vision mantle. Acts 13, 3 laid hands on them, 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 and sent, 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 sent them, them, them away. Your local church is not just to pile it up with all the people you can find. It's to spread the gospel to the four corners of the earth. It, it, it involves, whether you like it or not, and I pastored for, Sharon and I pastored for four decades. I didn't like sending my best. I had them pinpointed for staff and you know, I trained them all these years, and right when I can say they're ready to bring on, they are going away. I used to get kind of irritated with God. I'd say, God, I trained them, I get them. You know it's fair, but you better get over that because you don't train for yourself ever. You train people for where God is going to send them. When we started campuses, oh, the, the cry went up from Egypt of people griping. You mean some of my friends are going over to the other side of the city? I guess they are. Well, I won't see them. Well, you can go. Well, no, I have to be here. This is my church home is over this side and I can't go. I said, well, it's all right. No, you're taking our friends and family and splitting up family. I said, hey, the reason we exist is to multiply, not get into a beehive and buzz around each other. Make honey for ourselves. No. So I tried to convince them they didn't like it. So I finally said, remember, I said, by the way, are you going to heaven? You'll have plenty of time. <laughs> Fellowship.
fellowship yourself into eternity. But right now, we got a mission. We're on mission, folks. There are many unsaved people here in this city and around these cities that never, they've never had a church like this. They don't know anything about the presence of God. They know nothing about the gospel. You need to multiply yourself any way you can. My prophetic prediction is there will be some gripers and some praisers. Join the praisers. Turn your neighbor and say, he's talking to me. Okay, I lied because I said I was finishing, but I'm just going to uh, read these. I'm not going to preach these, but our response to the mantle the Lord has made for us. Would you read these slides out loud with me? Our response is... Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Are you ready? Yeah. We agree together. I think we'd do better if we stood up. And we shout a little bit and kind of take this in. Come on. We agree together. Next slide. We by faith pick up the mantle and stand our place with expectancy. Next one. We declare and believe the mantle rests on us. Next one. We believe the mantle on us will open the rivers in front of us, seize the miracles we need, and overcome the challenges we face. And everybody gave a great shout and a clap to the Lord. This Now just lift your hands straight up like a mantle is being slipped over you. Father, let that mantle come upon them, Holy Spirit of the living God, upon the heart of the city church and the Post Falls congregation, the campus. Lord, we're praying for a double portion. We're praying for a mantle that will open up in front of us all the miracles we need, overcoming the challenges we face. Lord, the best days are ahead for us. We cannot be stopped. We are the church. We're moving forward. God is on our side, and we believe great things is going to happen in the body of Christ, and we're a part of that. And we see.